Good morning. Y'all can do better than that. It's not that early in the morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is my pleasure. My name is George Brown, and I'm the state representative from Lexington, 77th Legislative House District, and I am the chair of the Kentucky Black Legislative Caucus. It is with great pleasure that we welcome you to the Kentucky Black Legislative Caucus inaugural speaker series. This year's theme is Black History is American History. And that's 24-7, 365, every year. You recently witnessed the KBC, KBLC Black History Celebration. Today is an extension of that event. You will recall that the theme was Black History is American History. Today we reach for individual expression beginning with our youth. This event is the first of a continuing series that will bring perspective, free expressions, and insight. We are delighted to have with us the Louisville and Lexington, Frankfurt Lexington chapters of the Lynx Incorporated. Thank you ladies for being here. You all are, you all are lovely and you're back in green. It is a pleasure to welcome all other guests and, and, and groups that are here present. I've met a couple of young men and, and the gentleman, Brother Rashad, from, from Louisville. Um, we also have, with, to all of the ladies, we wish you a happy Valentine's Day. You, you notice I said times, Valentine's Day, not Valentine's Day. <laughs> to celebrate romance, love, devotion, and commitment. Thank you for being who you are and what you represent. And now to bring you greetings, Senate Democratic Floor Leader Gerald Neal and Democrat, House Democratic Floor Leader Derek Graham, a first in the Kentucky General Assembly and in the history of the Commonwealth for two black leaders to reach this height in leadership and at the same time. Welcome, welcome Senator Neal and Senate Representative Graham. Good morning. Good morning. Had to check to make sure it's still morning. Uh, I want to tell you, I'm very delighted to uh, bring you greetings. This is our first. This is the inaugural speaker series, uh, born out of the idea that uh, celebrating black history was more than one day of celebration, but also an opportunity for introspection, for expression, uh, and et cetera. Uh, the fact that you're here, I just want to make the point, is that you are part of something history-making. Uh, this is the first, so we want to make sure you understand what this not only means to us, but hope that it also means the same thing to you. Uh, our friend, uh, our chairman, Brown, has indicated that I'm the Senate uh, Democratic floor leader. I have to tell you that in my body, we work as a team. So I'm delighted that I've been selected to lead that group and to work with that team. So with that being said, I want to introduce my, my, my counterpart, and, and he's also my leader as well, because he has contributed over the years so much in terms of the legislative process and has represented so well. I'm just proud to lead at his left or his right. Very grand. Uh, thank you, uh, my mentor. Uh, as I said last week, uh, I, I watched him from afar, and I've worked with him now for 21 years since I've been here, and he's always been the guiding light for me and for the rest of us who came after him while he was doing the work we were trying to achieve to get here. So thank you, my brother. And good morning to all of you, and on behalf of the people of Frankfort and Franklin County, I want to welcome you to your capital city. You know, this city, we share it with the other 119 counties. We're very proud of that. And my community has been Kentucky State Capitol ever since we joined the United States more than 230 years. For almost half of that time, the Capitol building has been the heart of our state government. It is where past governors, legislators, and judges brought about real and lasting gains, gains in civil rights and voting rights, 
gains in education and health care and social and criminal justice, gains that have given all of us a better life, all of us a better life, of which we have to continue that fight for those who follow us. And so these gains are the most definitely worth celebrating. But let us also celebrate a renewal commitment to add to them. I want future generations to recognize us, you and me, for the positive change that we create. We also have it in our power to do great things in this building, and we should not let that opportunity ever go by. There is a saying that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go farther, go together. Today and every day, going forward, let us pledge to travel far together. And on that journey, let us create the Kentucky we want for ourselves and for our children. Let us build a world where your success and my success and our success are truly in the same way. Thank you, God bless you, God keep you, and may you have safe travels back home. The Kentucky Black Legislative Caucus is delighted to present as our first speaker in this inaugural speaker series, Nino Owens. I want you to understand that this was done very intentionally because we know that the future belongs to our youth and we want to get an expression from our youth. Nino Owens is a junior, matriculating at the University of Louisville, majoring in political science and economics. He is a writer and activist. He serves as editor-in-chief of the Louisville Political Review, an independent student publication, and is a sought-after speaker on subjects ranging from black liberation, uh, felon voting rights, restoration, and related issues. In addition, he is a literary literacy mentor with the director, the Decode Project, an organization focused in eliminating literacy disparities in Louisville's black population. Ladies and gentlemen, Nino Owens. Welcome, Nino. Good morning. Good morning. Can you all hear me good? To Minority Leader Neal and the Kentucky Black Legislative Caucus, I thank you all for the opportunity to be the first spe featured speaker of the annual Black History Month Speaker Series. I take this responsibility seriously. This is true for two reasons. First, since I'm the inaugural speaker of a series with such a critical purpose, I must set a stable foundation of what the importance of black history is, which includes the history of Black History Month itself. Second. History is not dead. It is happening right now. Me and you are both a part of it. Any Black History Month address has to touch on the current as well as the past. In fact, I submit that we cannot understand the current without understanding the past and that the current is a product of the past. In other words, we are affected by history and we exist at a moment in history that will affect future generations. The moment in which we currently live is an urgent one. It, it requires our determination, it requires our focus, and it requires our collective action. Today I seek to connect these ideas. I seek to do this through a framework that will solve the problems that black people face right now, black nationalism. You might have had some reaction to that phrase in your mind or in your heart. This illuminates something important about our history. Often, the ideas that will be most helpful throughout our struggle for liberation are the most stigmatized, including black nationalism. It has been seen as too radical. To me, it's just logical. There are 44 million black people in the United States with a shared history, a shared culture, and a shared language, which means I can go to West Louisville and West Philadelphia and find people who look like me, talk like me, and think like me. It means I can go both to Harlem and Atlanta and find people who are suffering the same conditions. We are connected across the country. We are one people, a nation of people. If you don't believe me, just think with me for a little bit. Y'all know that we talk differently than everyone else in this society. Excuse me, y'all know we be talking different than everybody else out here. 
Y'all know that we have a shared history. Our ancestors were stolen from Africa. They were kidnapped and shipped across the Atlantic as if they were cattle. We got here as slaves. After slavery, we were sharecroppers. Then we became victims of segregation. Today, we remain politically abused, economically unorganized, and psychologically damaged. But we have a shared history not only of oppression, but of greatness. Which brings me to our culture. I don't have to discuss this long. Who makes better food than us? Who sings, writes, plays basketball, football, tennis, or even golf better than us? Our people have made great contributions in every field of endeavor. Philosophy, science, the arts, sports, and even politics. Y'all know that black people are responsible for most of the activist groups in this country holding nonviolent philosophies. Not only movements in this country, but all over the world have taken inspiration from that political philosophy that sprung up from our people. The world saw us dismantle one of the most inhumane his systems in history, Jim Crow, without firing a single bullet. That's what our culture is capable of. Not only is our culture beautiful, it is internationally recognized. Last winter break, I went to South America. I spoke to people there who knew more about Kanye West than I did. There were people putting me onto rap music, songs I had never heard of. That's the power and the breadth of our culture. Nationalism simply admits our peoplehood. It takes pride in it. And it knows that when our people who are one begin to act like they are one, we will begin to solve our problems. And it knows the only way to advance and develop our people is to organize them into their own institutions that will address their needs and interests. Don't be scared to be for yourself. Don't be scared to advocate for yourself. Don't be scared to organize to help your people. No one else in this country is. Why should we be? And don't be scared of what they might call you or say about you. You know you're not violent. You know you're not racist. You know you're not radical. People have called me a radical. Let's be clear about what black nationalism about, ah, let's be clear about what black nationalism is. It is a plan that will feed our people. It will build an economy for them. It will improve their health and lengthen their lives. It will ensure their political representatives are actually addressing their needs. These things are the bare minimum of civilization. I support this plan and I will work to bring it about. If that makes me a radical to you, that's your problem, not mine. Being humane is not radical. It should be our default condition. The founder of Black History Month knew this very well. Dr. Carter G. Woodson organized the first Negro History Week in 1926. A lifelong educator, Woodson understood that black people are thoroughly miseducated. He believed the remedy to this was for black people to educate themselves about themselves, that they should find their origins, study their current condition, condition and devise their own ways of improving it. This is what Black History Month is about. It's about ensuring our people and our future generations understand who they are, how they are connected to American society, and how they are connected to the rest of humanity. It's for these reasons we celebrate Black History Month, and these reasons alone. Black History Month is a timely reminder in the new year that without understanding our past, we cannot understand our right now. And without understanding our present, we cannot prepare for our future. The, this truth that Black History Month is intended foremost to combat miseducation leads us to confront myths that are perpetually spread about this month. Unfortunately, because we are miseducated, they are often spread by us. First, that February is the shortest month of the year and coincidentally also Black History Month. I've heard some of us say this jokingly, but I've also heard some of us say it and be dead serious. February was chosen for Black History Month because Frederick Douglass's and Abraham Lincoln's birthday are both in this month. That's all. The other, two myths, <laughs> the other two myths are more serious because they misorient us by sounding good but actually making no sense. The second myth is that we don't need Black History Month. We need to celebrate black history all the time. This is true. Our history must be consistently studied. But if you only pay attention to your history during Black History Month, you might as well not study it at all because you are betraying the very purpose of the event, which is to remind yourself who you are and to combat miseducation. Everyone needs reminders. We all need specific events that pique our interest on what is important. Once February is over, our education continues. Last is the most insidious myth, that black history is American history. Once again, the statement is true. 
In fact, it cannot be denied. We built this country involuntarily and for free. America would not be as nearly as prominent as it is without our contributions. On top of that, <laughs> on top of that, we have had to struggle to be treated as human beings in this country. Our struggle for humanity has led to more humane treatment for all types of people. Our history is inseparable from American history, and American history is inseparable from black history. This is a clear fact. So why are we using Black History Month to try to prove it to people who refuse to see it? Black History Month is supposed to serve us, not convince others of our successes. <laughs> Miseducation goes far past just our understanding of Black History Month. It affects every aspect of our thinking. It's up to us to fix it. Not even the universities can do this for us. We have to challenge miseducation and free our minds. Once we free our minds, we then and only then can free our people. If we review our history, we will see that we have never made gains in this country without collective action, ever. It took a civil war that we fought in to be freed from the plantation. It took a mass movement decades to finally earn our citizenship, 100 years after the civil war ended. We took that citizenship and what do we do with it? We exist as individuals. From the top to the bottom of our community, we have isolated ourselves from helping each other. What good is individualism for the sake of individualism? The talents, skills, and energies of the individual matter for what they can bring to the collective because the individual can't exist without it. And the collective dies without the contribution of the individual. Our collective is dying. You know it. Our people live in food deserts because we haven't started any grocery stores. Our people don't have an economy because we barely own any banks or insurance companies. Our people have the worst health in America, and we own only one hospital. Our boys are being thrown in prison. They die within our communities. They're being attacked from every direction. If you don't believe it, come to a college campus. I see it every day. Seeing another black man on campus that's not an athlete is like seeing a unicorn. And what do we do? We know this is happening. We know the causes of our problems and have been trained to address them scientifically. Instead of serving our people, most of us desert them. We run to work in a corporation or in the government. We run to the very institutions that fought against our citizenship in the first place. We run away from the problems chasing a consistent paycheck, a good job. We neglect our responsibility while our brothers and sisters languish. Our professional capabilities are misallocated. They're being wasted because all we care about is ourselves and our own well-being. Our ancestors bled so we'd have the right to gain these skills. We've sold their sacrifice. Someone once said, man makes money, money doesn't make the man. That's how we must begin to operate. Maybe it would be okay for us to do this, to sell our skills in this way, if we at least had economic institutions to catch the money and reinvest it to develop our nation. But as soon as we make a dollar, it leaves our community to enrich others. Not only that, we trip over ourselves to throw our money away. Because individualism produces materialism. And materialism pervades our community. I know y'all have seen all the boys shooting other boys for Jordans. Y'all see it up to the middle class in our community. We have cars that we don't own. Houses we don't own. Financed by the banks of the people who owned us. I wish I could say individualism only affected our economics. I wish I could say that, because we'd be just fine. Because black people will survive. But it affects our culture. It affects our spirit. And it affects our relationships. It even affects the way our history is told. Our history is told to us as a straight line, or maybe two competing lines that cannot coexist. Violence or nonviolence, segregation or integration, good or evil. Surely our history can't be this simple. And who gets to decide who's good and who's evil? I was taught that Malcolm was evil, that his methods were wrong and evil. They don't even know his methods. Because if you tell me Malcolm's methods were violence, you don't know Malcolm. We should love Dr. King. He was a great black man, a great leader for his people. But we should get to choose Dr. King, not have him forced upon us. We should get to choose our own role models and our own philosophies. We are human beings. History is not a straight line. 
History is that great unfinished tapestry of human advancement that is woven every second. It flows along years, it loops around decades, and it bounds through centuries. Life is but one thread in the overall project. Different colors, lengths, and patterns abound, though every thread has its own important purpose. The individual character of each is determined by its own unique experiences, actions, and thoughts, its own history. But even that individuality is thoroughly connected to the great project of history. They are inseparable. It is all of us together, not one leader who makes history. We cannot wait for another great person to come and save us. We must start building now, right now. But to build, we first have to be unified. The only way to build our unity is to love each other. This may sound cliche, but it is so important. And I'm not talking about a blind love that's superficial. I'm talking about a true love that starts amongst ourselves toward ourselves. Dr. King called it agape love, taken from the New Testament. It's a self-love that builds unity in our community, a love that can only be shown through action. It's the love that will compel our leaders to remember the masses and work for them in earnest. It's a love that tells the truth about our political, economic, and social situation, one that never betrays history or its many lessons. It's a love that will make the elite members of our community remember every single man and woman in our community, reach down, and help pull them up. It's a love that seeks to understand plight, not a superficial love that blames the victims of it. It's a love that stresses patience first and avoids petty divisions. And I'm not done. It's a love that adores our kinky hair and knows that no little black girl has bad hair. Not one. It's a love that appreciates all black skin, whether it's as dark as chocolate or as light as mine. It's the love that moved my auntie to take me to go get dress clothes before I started my first internship. It's the love that black men must find and spread amongst ourselves, one that fuels the sacred responsibilities to our people, to provide and to protect. One that ensures that black men love, respect, protect, and promote black women. It's an act of love that knows our lives are not a competition, it knows that we fight not against each other, not against flesh and blood. It knows we fight against powers, principalities, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we fight against. It's this unconditional and undying love for our people we must have to begin to develop ourselves and our community. After developing love for ourselves and amongst ourselves, we then, and only then, can develop healthy, loving relationships with all other peoples. Too often, Black people have been expected to stretch our capacity to love with none in return, sometimes with outright hatred in return. This has made us loving of everyone except for ourselves. Those days are over. The love preached by Dr. King is an eternal principle. We should strive to make it a reality in our community. We have already addressed how individualism affects us and how we can build unity in our community through love. Working on both of these areas, will allow us to work together better to accomplish our common goals. The final aspect of miseducation we must address today is our dependency on institutions that don't serve our interests or care for our needs. Too often, important decisions that affect the livelihood of black people are made by people and institutions that have never had and don't currently have our best interests at heart. We have left our development in the hands of the very institutions that have stymied our progress for all, this years, all these years. And then we wonder why we're not making any in 2023. When our interests are at stake, rarely can we move without someone else's approval. We are left to wait, to be patient, and to tolerate incremental change while our people die in the streets. When will we decide to build independent power to solve our own problems? When will we take the responsibility of improving our own condition? When will we realize that our current strategy has left us with nothing but empty expectations for the last 60 years? Our problems grow more complicated as long as we neglect them. I can give you an example. A couple weeks ago, Governor Ron DeSantis banned black history curriculum from being taught in Florida public schools. His decision was disappointing, but I hope it wasn't surprising. As I heard and read all the visceral reactions to his refusal, I became more disappointed because almost everyone I heard focused on condemning DeSantis and condemning his decision. 
The only solution being proposed was for DeSantis to change his mind. Once again, we are reduced to a community of beggars, hoping that our history will be taught to us by someone else, someone who has never claimed he would do it in the first place. Don't misunderstand me, he is wrong, dead wrong, because he's refusing to fulfill the responsibility of truly educating his citizens. But that is who he is. Their whole ideology is that they, don't, they want to lie to their kids about the true nature and the true history of this society. Our kids, who are the minority in their institutions, get miseducated as a result. So while DeSantis is wrong, our responsibility to educate our kids remains. If we know that our children are being miseducated, we cannot allow it to continue unchallenged. If they decide to lie to their children, that's their business, but we can't allow them to lie to ours too. And this didn't start with DeSantis. Before any of these history whitewashing bills were passed, our history still was not taught. In high school history class, we spent only one class period covering black history, the whole school year. This is a problem as old as the school system itself. And it's only getting worse today with this new rise of legislation, especially across the South. And so where does that leave us? It leaves us to wonder whether the next time they exempt us from the curriculum, will we just complain and condemn them again? Or by then, will we have committed ourselves to teaching black history in our homes, in our churches, in our schools? Did you know that there are HBCUs that don't even require their students to take African American history courses? If we are not serious about teaching our history, how can we expect Ron DeSantis to be? If we are serious about teaching our history, we don't need Ron DeSantis to be. So this dependent mindset must go. It must be replaced by a mindset of freedom and self-determination. This may be hard to imagine, our community operating on its own force. I'll give you all a more practical example, close to home, of how it could play out. Before that, I've got to give some context. We have been fighting for the right to vote since the day our ancestors stepped off the plantations. We were supposedly granted this right after emancipation by the 15th Amendment. But even during Reconstruction, people who registered black people to vote faced intimidation and violence from groups like the Ku Klux Klan. When Northern troops were withdrawn from the South in 1876, we quickly lost the right to vote as a community, as Jim Crow legislation solidified. It wasn't until 1965, almost 100 years later, that our vote became protected and ensured, mostly. Unfortunately, as we stand here today in 2023, this fight is still not done, especially here in Kentucky. In this state, 15% of black people cannot vote. In this state, 20% of black men cannot vote. So if you took five black men from this room, statistically, one of us can't vote. What's the cause of these statistics that are marked by the stench of discrimination? Felon disenfranchisement. Kentucky is one of two states in the entire country that permanently restricts the right to vote from former convicts who have paid their debt to society. Former convicts who are now free. They pay taxes just like me and you. They have to follow laws just like me and you. They have to live under the regulation of this government just like me and you. They have no representation. Unlike me and you, they have no voice in all of these things. They don't live in a democracy. A democracy is a form of government where every citizen has a voice. That's the definition. And we don't live in a democracy because we share the society with them and they have no voice. It is the responsibility of every citizen to do what they can to ensure every other citizen can vote. And it is the responsibility of every official in this government to ensure the citizens they serve can vote. This brings us to the example I mentioned earlier. We appreciate Governor Bashir's executive order, restoring the right to vote to about half of the people in question. But it's not enough at all. We have to ask Governor Bashir, how can you be for a free Kentucky, a more just Kentucky, a more equitable Kentucky, if 200,000 citizens don't have the right to vote and you have the power to grant it? There is no Team Kentucky if 200,000 Kentuckians cannot vote. What type of team leaves 200,000 of, 200, of their teammates in the Jim Crow era? We have to find out how Governor Bashir and his administration 
can be for all these principles but not put them into action in their policy. If what they're saying is not matching up with what they're doing, then there must be some political consideration keeping them from doing what's right. We have to urge them to be courageous enough to stand up and expand democracy in our state. If Mr. Bashir is not courageous enough to fulfill his responsibility, then I have to ask you, will we be courageous enough come November to leave his box empty on the ballot? In 2019, Mr. Bashir won by only 5,000 votes. That is the smallest margin of victory in any gubernatorial election in Kentucky's history. We, as a community, voted 85% for Mr. Bashir. In other words, without black people, Mr. Bashir would not be governor today. How can we, in good conscience, use our votes to give him back this position? when he has refused to utilize the power it grants him to end this fight we've been in for so long. He could end it today. All he has to do is sit down, sign a piece of paper, and 200,000 people will be given their right to vote back. One piece of paper could end a generational struggle. And this is not a special interest. This is not just a black problem. These are, there are white people, Latino people, black people, all types of people who cannot vote because of this. Yes, disenfranchisement is wrong because it's racist, but it's also wrong because it's undemocratic regardless of race. But we, as a community, are in a position to say we need the right to vote today or else. Respectfully too, because politics is not about personalities. It is about substance. It is about tangible gains. We don't have any beef with Andy Bashir. He's been a good governor. He skillfully led our state through COVID, tornadoes in Western Kentucky, floods in eastern Kentucky, back to back to back. He's had a very difficult first term, but we cannot guarantee him a second while he so flagrantly violates our interests. Our votes are worth more than that. Our ancestors died for them. They're worth more than symbolism. We need action. We have the opportunity to secure democracy in our state if we collectively act with our vote. We have the opportunity to show that it's going to take more than just to have a deed next to your name for us to commit our vote to you. It will take more than having blue signs instead of red signs. We need to see improvements. We also need action from the General Assembly. We need them to propose a constitutional amendment that would restore the right to vote permanently. An executive order can always be reversed. We need an amendment for the long run. So call your representatives and tell them you support House Bill 97. House Bill 97, and that they should pass it this session. They're talking about passing the next session. Tell them they should pass it this session. Dr. King said, the time is always right to do what is right. Let's do what is right. Today we talked about some important things. We talked about how we can solve our problems. We talked about how to view our history. We learned about the history of Black History Month. We learned about miseducation. Know that we only scratched the surface on that topic. Miseducation can't be fully addressed in one speech or even one book. It will take consistent efforts to actually face it. It will take us facing it in our schools, in our homes, in our hearts, and in our minds to ever fully address it. But today we brought some of it to light. Individualism and materialism must go. We must build unity in our community through love, and we must become less dependent on these institutions and more focused on building our own. I'll leave you with one more thought from the founder of Black History Month, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him to stand here or go yonder. He will find his proper place and stay in it. You do not have to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for his own special benefit. His education makes it necessary. Thank you. Some hard truths, some sobering thoughts. Thank you, Nino Owens. We're now going to have some closing remarks from Representative Lameen Swan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, what a display of passionate talent and intellect 
Uh, thank you, Nito Owens, for your bringing your uh, insights and your perspectives of your message. We all like uh, like to meet today with uh, interpretation and commitment uh, to do our part in making this nation more perfect uh, union. Uh, thank you for being our inaugural speaker. And you made history today. Uh, let's give Nemo, I'm, I'm sorry, Nemo a hand. <laughs> and thank you all for being here today, uh, your attendance and your participation in part of this uh, history making here today. Uh, there is another speaker series uh, coming up next Tuesday, February 21st, at the Old Kentucky Capitol House Chamber located, there is no address in here, but um, your, you know, Google Maps. <laughs> I had a lot of you know. Uh, this event features uh, esteemed uh, Dr. Gerald Smith, he is great, uh, UK history professor and author, in a panel discussing the history, uh, the history and the context of our you know, I'm sorry, a theme, Black History in America's History. The event will be the first collaboration between the, sorry. The Kentucky, I'm sorry, the Kentucky Black Legislative Caucus and the Kentucky Historical Society uh, and the African American Initiative. You do not want to miss this event coming up next week. Thank you and thank you for being here. Have a great day.